But good evening and welcome to the Toronto Camera Club meeting for Thursday, February, what is it, 16th? My name is John Milliker and I'm club president for the 2022-2023 season. The Arundel Camera Club was founded in 1957 and exists to promote the art, science, and education in all aspects and fields of photography. For more information about us, please visit www.arundelcameraclub.org. We are so happy to be meeting in person and online. If you are local to Anne Arundel County, Maryland, we encourage you to visit us at the Severna Park Baptist Church. I'm probably not in the camera. At 506 Benfield Road, Severna Park, Maryland. Um... Before we move to tonight's program, uh, do we have any announcements from officers? Yes, sir. I'm standing in for uh, Don Kaiser. We had two announcements. Okay. Remind me, the next week is the print competition for drawing. Mm -hmm. And the second one is the MCA has Oh, wow. How much is it if you're not a club member? <laughs> Become a member. It's cheaper. <laughs> that was it. Okay. Perfect. Okay, what Bob said, Bob's filling in for Ron. Ron, if you're joining us virtually, I hope you're feeling a little bit better. Uh, MPA has a black and white contest coming. Uh, if, you are a, uh, if you are a paid member with the Arundel Camera Club, you would have received a code in your email that gives you two free entries. That's actually pretty cool. If you didn't get it because, of course, uh, Gmail doesn't like Ron, uh, maybe double check your, your junk folder and um, email him if you don't have a code. And we'll go from that. As a reminder, uh, it's as we're at the, the second half of our year, our membership fees are in half for the rest of the year. That'll get you maybe some codes. I don't know where the cutoff is, but it gets you some entries in uh, upcoming photo contests as well. You get to try your luck at, at the photo contests. Uh, let's see. Um, where's my other notes, Christine? Did you steal them? Yes. Christine stole my notes. Thank you, dear. Okay. Okay. Um, Look out for an email next week. We have an exhibition coming up. Woods Church has asked us back. An exhibition from May to uh, May to June, I believe it is. They're kind of asking us to give it maybe like a Mother's Day kind of feel, but I'm not entirely sure uh, if many of us really, and that qualifies for, for that, but, uh, but we'll see what we can make happen. But look out for an email from that. Also, uh, next week on the 23rd, we have the print contest for glass, right? And um, March 2nd, Padma Nguva, I apologize if I didn't spell that name correctly, with a program on floral photography. March 9th, digital contest open virtual. And then on the March 16th, Mark Batista with compositions shooting with intent. That's a really cool lineup, Christine, coming up. And uh, I want to welcome our, our new members, Tommy, Michelle, and Steve. And I've seen you here before. Remember your name? I'm Sally. And Sally. Welcome, guys. I really appreciate you guys coming up. Hope you enjoy the club. I think we're good. Do we have anything else? I think that's it. So what I'm going to do is uh, I, I, I'm going to apologize in advance. This is yet another new streaming kind of scenario. We have Lori Langford. Lori, where are you coming from? I'm over in Frederick, Maryland. Oh, she's over in Frederick, but this is the first time we've had a virtual speaker here while we're meeting in person virtually. So hopefully we're going to turn it over to Lori, and uh, and uh, she's got a great program coming up for us. Christine, do you have an introduction for Lori that... Uh Christine wants a second. Yeah. Hey, JC. Yeah, if, if everything looks a little bit different, uh, they, they wax the floors in the fellowship hall, so we're up upstairs. Christine was very nice enough to be able to, uh, to man the door for us. You ready? John, can you see my screen? I can see you. Only oh, you. Oh, you can't see the screen? I can't see your screen yet. Let's get you figured out on that, and then I'll, I'll put everybody that's virtual over to that. Let me give this to Christine. <laughs> Can you see it now? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so Lori is an established nature photographer. Well, I can't talk. 
is an established nature photographer, digital artist, and instructor. She is known for her creative approach to photography, stunning flower portraits, abstract nature scenes, and creative close-ups. She has photographed many of the top gardens across the country and has images exhibited in local and national gallery exhibits as well as in printed publications. She has a love for teaching and sharing her passion for creative nature photography and leads workshops in the Maryland, Virginia, DC areas. And her website, we will make sure, is posted to our stream. Go ahead, Lori. <laughs> Sorry, I haven't gotten to talk to you yet. <laughs> That's OK. Thank you, everyone. I um, wish I was there in person with you, but I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you tonight um, and share a little bit about the topic of looks like a painting. So as I go through the presentation tonight, the majority of images that I'm going to share are going to be more of my floral um, nature images. I do have some other scenes, but the techniques that I'm going to cover, as well as the editing techniques, can be used with any style of photography. So we will jump in. What I want to try to do is cover first some of the techniques, and then I do, I'm hoping that technology will work, and I want to go into Photoshop and actually show you some live demonstrations of some of the editing tools that I like to use to create images um, in an artistic way. So we're going to cover some shooting techniques, again, editing. And as an introduction, I always like to give people ideas of inspiration. And the idea of a photo looking like a painting really started with the idea of impressionism. And so if you've studied impressionism and if you think about Monet and Degas and some of those, um, it's these techniques that they use that made their work so popular. And it's techniques that we can actually use in photography. So they had short, broken brush strokes, um, unblended colors, and an emphasis on light and how light is affected in their um, paintings. Rather than neutral whites, grays, or blacks, they often rendered shadows and highlights actually in color. And so that's something we can also do using tools like color grading or filters. And the idea of an impressionism or an impressionistic painting is light color, texture, blurred lines, and shapes are used to create those magical images. And those are some of the same techniques that we can um, incorporate into our photography. Impressionism um, also really lacked a finish. So sometimes with a painting, it truly looks like an oil painting. Other times it may look like an abstract or an impressionistic painting. So depending on the style of art that you're interested in, you can also make a photograph look like pop art or a cartoon. So if you are really into this genre and, and trying to make your photos look more like a piece of art, think about what type of art you want to um, emulate and maybe study that art to get some ideas from it. So the first technique that I want to cover is multiple exposure. And multiple exposure is a great way to, in camera, get something that looks a little more like a painting. Now this style is going to definitely resemble more of an impressionistic style. Um, it could also be a little abstract depending on what you're shooting. So I've also shot multiple exposure of buildings, architecture, and that really looks more abstract. So multiple exposure, again, adds a softness. It's an impressionistic look. And you can do it in camera if your camera has that set up. Most new cameras do. Um, or you can use it in Photoshop or another program where you can blend the images together. Now, you'll want to, of course, check your camera manual and follow that process. But that's where you're layering one image on top of another and getting a look that you want. Again, you could do this to get something that looks impressionistic, but you could also do something that's much more abstract with lines and angles. Um, when to use, really anywhere works great. This image was in Chicago um, outside of the um, art museum, and these trees were just this gorgeous color. It was like the last day of fall, and I just layered them with um, two, two images, one on top of the other, to give it much more of a painting look. And then I really didn't have to do anything else to this image. I tweaked the colors just a little, but that's the beauty really of using multiple exposure. Now this is a nature image where I also was standing at this scene and I thought I really wanna capture it in a unique way and I wanna capture it 
um, and really showcase the beauty much more than just a single image. So again, I did a double exposure, multiple exposure of this shot. Now, if you look in your camera settings for multiple exposure, there are usually four different blend modes. There's an additive, average, bright, and dark. And I encourage you to play around with those. I just recently started using the dark option. And that's where the dark portions of the image are overlaid um, almost like a silhouette. And so they don't disappear. And it's a really nice technique to get that painting look. If you use the bright feature, it will, pro it will make more prominent the bright areas and your dark areas will go away. And so it kind of makes it look like you have a lacy image. Um, average averages the light and additive works nice in low light situations. So just another way to play um, to create these artistic art like images. So this was an example of a spring scene in DC where I just again spring is which it's coming fast, a great way to create images that look like a painting. Um, this was two shots in average mode where I just overlapped them to just really showcase all the layers of these gorgeous blooms. This was some plum trees um, in DC and five shots in average mode, just um, overlapped ma matching these larger tree trunks. And again, just wanting to have something kind of abstract and showcasing the beautiful um, colors of spring. This was two shots. You can see the ghosting of the benches and um, just really, again, overlapped for that texture. And then an oil paint in Photoshop was added afterwards to just give an even, even more of that painting quality. Anna already discussed this one. Um, two shots, again, overlapped. So multiple exposure not in camera is where you would use a program or an app where you can layer your images together. And so this is one where I was shooting these daffodils and I just thought, let me um, shoot different sections of them. And then I put them together in Photoshop, blending the three images using different opacity layers and um, bringing them together to make one image. And then this is using what's uh, a lot of um, creative photographers call the, <clears throat> excuse me, the glow technique, where you take your original shot, you take your second shot a little bit out of focus, you take your shirt third shot completely almost out of focus, and then you blend the three together to get a really soft, again, painterly look. Now this technique can be really used with anything. It works really beautiful in a landscape scene, um, if you're shooting something out on water, it works really nice. You can even use it with, um, with people, maybe where you want the background to be really soft and dreamy. Um, and it's just where you're changing your blend modes and then you're changing your focus as you take your shots. Another process as well to create this final image, just taking the first shot with a focus here, second image a little bit out of focus, third image even more, and just blending those together to create a more soft kind of artistic layered image. All right, so multiple exposure is one way. Another, if you're not familiar, have heard of the artist Pep Ventosa. I absolutely love his work and it his work truly looks like a painting and it would take it would take months years who knows how long for someone to paint his work so his method and you can look him up on his website is the shooting in the round technique and this is one of his images um, and so they have this multiple exposure type effect or ghosting effect but they definitely look like a painting so his work is where you walk around the subject. Now, this is one of my shots of a spring tree again, um, but you are, I'll give you an example. So you're taking shots as you go around the subject. You're trying to stay about the same distance from your subject. And then you're going to combine those images again in a program like Photoshop or something where you can um, merge the images together. But as you merge each layer, if you're using Photoshop, you change the blend mode. So your first shot's at 100%, and then as you blend the next ones, you reduce the opacity through your layers. 
You can also shoot these images walking a scene. So you could walk a horizontal scene and you're capturing shots as you go. And they just really add that layering kind of ghosting effect. Another example is if you shoot something stationary. So a flower in a vase, you can be all set up on your tripod and you just turn the vase as you're shooting to get all the multiple shots. The trick is you really do need to be able to use a program like Photoshop or the free version um, Photo P to add all these layers together. I recommend that you have at least 24 shots. You can do much more than that. And if you look at Pep's website, most of his images are um, well over 90 images or more that he has combined and put together. So these are some flower shots that I did using his method. These have about 20 um, images together. And again, I was on a tripod, so I was just turning my vase ever so slowly as I took the shots. And same thing with this flower. So a very different style, kind of a combination of a modern and an impressionistic um, look. And then these, I think, definitely resemble more of that painting quality. Um, and again, these are about 24 to 40. I think this fall tree was about 40 shots. And it very much looks like pointillism, which is another style um, of art where you've got the little dots everywhere. And so these leaves really resembled that. It's a really fun technique to try and um, to, to work on and, and play with. It does take the shooting as well as the editing. So some other options for thinking about creating something that looks like a painting is, of course, different lenses that you can use as well as your editing. And I think most images that you see out there that look like a painting, it's really the editing that has made it that way. You can also decide how you set up your scene. If you shoot people, you know, your props, you could create a very old fashioned scene or you could do something that looks very pop art. Um, but if you're just shooting general, then you can convert your image in post-processing. So a couple other techniques to cover would be free lensing. So free lensing, if you're not familiar, is where you can take the image, exposing it while your lens is actually off your camera. And it's creating like a tilt effect with your, your lens. And it's where you're, of course, selective focusing because your camera is not going to use autofocus with the lens removed. So it creates a very dreamy image. It can be challenging the first few times that you try it, but you can definitely create images that look like you added blur, look like you really did like a watercolor effect. So they really can be beautiful. Again, I think my favorite time of the year to use this is in spring because the colors just really work to give that watercolor look. You can see these images were shot again using that. This was straight out of camera, just using the tilt um, free lens feature. There are several great YouTube videos out there if you just search um, free lensing or they call it lens whacking um, that really explain it kind of live demonstrating. Um, again, these are some of those straight out of camera images where it really looks like a watercolor um, because of that effect when you're shooting. So another option is some creative lenses. So there are several new tilt lenses on the market. There's also the company Lens Baby that makes a variety, I mean, just tons of lenses that give you these creative looks that really do look like something super artistic and um, a painting-like image. So if you're really into this type of creative work, um, Lens Baby's a very pretty affordable lenses to add to your collection. There are some other um, kind of off-brand tilt lenses that have just come out on the market in the past year, and so they're worth considering as well. These are some nature shots taken with the Lens Baby, and again, they just give this really painted painted look because of the blur and the swirls and the way it captures these leaves. So it's a fun way in camera that you can get some images that look a little more um, painterly-like. And some more shot with the lens baby. Um, again, just getting this kind of swirl and texture of this same spot where I captured those, um, those spring blooms. 
And this image was, was with a lens baby as well, but it was a multiple exposure on the bright mode. So you can see the, the leaves on this look lacy, and that's because I shot it on the bright mode. So um, those brightness, it kind of makes it give it that lacy effect. So I'm going to pause there and see if there are any questions about techniques before I really dive into post-processing. I want to talk about post-processing, but then I really, I have a lot of images that I can walk you through and do some demonstrations. But what questions for me about techniques? Do you have any questions for Lori? Yes, JC. Uh, like, uh, would she consider ICM or in-camera movement a part of that process? Lori, that's a, that's a good one. Uh, we had Tony Sweet here, oh, probably a good eight, nine, ten years ago. Uh, what JC asked was in-camera movement, and, and you, may rem you may know Tony Sweet doing that swoosh and swipes and all that fun stuff. Yes, I've actually um, was with uh, or saw Tony last um, spring when I was in Charleston, his workshop and mine. We were at the same location um, one day, and I've, of course, watched him on many conferences, and he's a great guy. So, yes, I didn't include intentional camera movement. I probably should have. It's one of my favorites. Um, so, yes, intentional camera movement is going to give you that abstract um, painting look, and it would be another method that you could use for sure. Okay. Any other questions for Lori? Yes, we have two in the back. What Bob's asking when you're talking about off camera or the the, the lens whacking, um, he just wants to verify that you mean that you it is not mounted to the camera. There's a little bit of there's air between the camera and the lens, right? Yes. So um, you have to, of course, be comfortable taking your lens off and you want to of course not on a windy day and you need to still hold it right next to the body of the camera I usually keep my finger kind of just giving it a little space and then you're tilting it to let in some light you don't want to let in too much and then you're going to have to move yourself to find a spot of focus um and so that that can definitely be the trick you want to use a fixed lens typically um, you know, if you shoot Canon or have the equivalent on your on your camera, like a Nifty 50, those are pretty inexpensive lenses, and um, they do a really nice job of free lensing. So I actually have one that's broken, and I just keep it in my bag just for free lensing because it's just handy to grab and try. Now, Laura, we have one more question, but before that, do you clean your own sensor? I do. So I shoot mirrorless now and I have gotten comfortable cleaning it because you have to. Um, it's I, I take my lens on and off so much and I'm out in the garden that I had to learn to clean it myself. So, yes. Good. Susan, did you have a question? Same as, Same as Bob's. Yeah, they think together. They think alike. Christine, you want to read uh, you want to read that question? OK, online, Scott is asking, what is doing the work here? Your eye, the lenses or the software? It appears eyes are pushed aside. I think on the Ooh. picture that's up right now. Um, well, I would I would challenge him no. Um, so I believe that the foundation of all photography is um, is your composition and your eye. You've you've got to see the scene and interpret it, but the technique is going to then um, bring even your your creative vision to life. So if I go out and see a beautiful nature scene and I decide I'm going to compose it and take a regular shot, I usually pause and think, is there something maybe creative I want to add to that scene? Sometimes it doesn't need it. So, um, you know, I was on an amazing bucket trip, went to Glacier National Park and shot for like a week. And yeah, I didn't do a lot of these creative, hardly any creative techniques. Um, the images and the nature stood on its own, but sometimes it's fun. And so it's, how do I want to enhance this image? And that's where the techniques come in. And then the final and post-processing or the post-processing is really bringing that final vision to life. So, but it has to start with a solid image. I, I teach a lot of students and you can't, you can try your best to take an average image and make it something, but you really, it, it starts with the foundation. Good answer. Any other questions? Laurie, can you explain to Ed what a lens baby is? Oh, so lens baby is a brand of lenses that are, um, they make them for all different camera types. So you can get them that fit 
Canon, Nikon, Fuji, whatever. Um, they've been around for a while now. They're metal base lenses, very sturdy, and they have all different functions. So there are um, there's a series that's called Velvet that put a velvet glow around um, your images at a certain aperture. There, in, there are some that give you swirly bokeh. There's some that twirl, they're tilt. You'd have to go to their website and the, the selections are really um, incredible and the things that they do. But again, back to the other question, you've got to be able to um, understand light and understand composition. Um, otherwise, most people don't like those lenses because they are only enhancing what you're seeing with your eye and what you want the vision of, your, of the picture to be. But they're fun. They are manual focus lenses. So you have to be comfortable with that. Um, and um, so that can be frustrating for some people too. Excellent. Any more questions here in the audience? There are lots of programs out there where you can take a regular picture, a regular photo, and turn it into something artistic like that. Yeah, JC, JC comments that there are programs that kind of do this, but... And, and Lori, I'll let you answer that, but it's it's the difference between doing something organic versus versus a, a, a program. Um, so what do you think about that, Lori? Is he meaning an AI program? Like maybe AI or maybe Corel Paint or yeah, something? I, there is a, I can't think of the name of it right now, but I've even tried it myself on that particular program. I can't think of the name of it. You just take your regular photo, and what it really is actually just I guess it's a preset that someone has already did what it is really in the world. And you just put that preset on top of your photo. Gotcha. Like he, he doesn't remember the exact, the exact program, but it, it definitely had presets in there. Yes. Yeah, so there are, um, and we'll, we'll go ahead and jump into the creative editing piece. There are programs like Luminar, Neo, um, Topaz that have what's called um, kind of like looks. They are a step above a filter and they do creative things to your image. And so that's a way to make an image look like a Degas painting or Monet. You still have to be able to manipulate that creatively. If you just throw it on the image, you know, it's going to look like that. So you can make things look like pop art or sketches. There are also apps that do that. And so, um, you know, absolutely. You can use apps, you can use various programs that are going to convert your image. And I'm going to talk about some of those apps um, that you can use if you want to take a shot and make it look um, like something fun. Um, so we'll dive into some editing and then I can definitely answer more questions. Um, so creatively, you know, you can add some blur, you can reduce clarity, apply um, painted oil filters, which are available in Photoshop pretty easily. There's new neuro filters in Photoshop that do some creative elements. Adding texture is gonna make it look like a painting. And that's a very gentle way to make something look more artistic, but still maintain the properties of the image. You can also use brushes like in Photoshop to add texture, to give it that painted quality. Um, there are creative editing apps, um, all kinds of different options. So these are drastic changes where it was using an app, um, which was Topaz Studio 2, that converts it to something that might be on a, you know, a, in a magazine or something on a postcard or a gift card. It's, you know, it's not, definitely doesn't look like a, a photo any longer. Um, and it was very heavily done. Um, these are images where more I've taken an artistic approach adding some texture, some snow, the moon, um, some texture, just doing some things to create more of a painterly image. And there is a whole uh, genre of painterly images where people love to add, you know, birds, light, snow, um, just taking a basic image and making it almost like a composite, um, adding elements to it. So some more where I've just taken some creative liberty to bring the image to life, um, adding some texture, light, snow. Um, and these are very similar to a composite image. There's just not another photo added. It's more adding elements to the image to make it look like a painting. So some favorite apps. These are going to be um, iPad or um, other 
other programs. Um, I think they run on other Android as well. But um, like Waterlog is going to make your image look like a watercolor and you can actually use it on your phone. Um, there's this one, Ollie. iColorama is an amazing program. It's a little bit more complicated to use, but it it does. It's unbelievable all the stuff that it does. Um, Distressed FX is probably my all-time favorite. It allows you to add texture, birds. Um, it's it it does a little masking. It's just really beautiful um, qualities that it adds. Um, there's a program called Format that also does filters. There's Glaze makes your image look really heavy glazed. Um, if you like that, there's a program called Brushstroke. I mean, there are so many out there now, um, but these are some that I've I've used and have had um, other students use as well. So another technique is within Photoshop, you can create your own pointillism image. And so I'll show you down here was this little just, you know, I was walking on a trail um, in South Carolina in the early spring and all the magnolias are blooming and just took this random shot knowing that I wanted to make it this pointillism-like image. And um, in Photoshop, it's, it's really easy to do, but you can also do it, of course, with different applications. This is another example where this was the basic shot of this wildflower fall scene, and then going into Photoshop and manipulating it um, with multiple steps, I was able to um, create it where it's more of that pointillism style, which is dots. All right, so I want to take you into Photoshop, and um, this was an image with uh, intentional camera movement. So while I didn't talk about that, yes, it is a great way to create an image that looks more like a painting. Um, this is my website. I also have a YouTube channel where I share editing videos um, about once a week. Sometimes I skip a week or two, but um, on a variety of topics, and um, I started it years ago, and it's it's grown, and um, if you're interested in it, it's mainly editing is what I cover in there, but um, wanted to share that with you tonight. All right, so I'll jump over to Photoshop and... Um, Laura, do you want to take a couple questions if we have them? Sure, go ahead. Do we have any questions here in the audience? Do we have any questions online? Laura, I have a question. When you composite your images, are you using images that, that you've shot? Or are, you, are you using some, ice, some, some stock photography sites? Uh, what is your kind of thinking on that? And I'm sure, you're use, I'm sure you're, you've got a collection of your own images. What's your kind of thought process on when you're out and about photographing stuff? Uh, you know, what are you looking for to put in that, that folder that where you can, that folder of, hey, let's post the, let's paste these things over top at some other point? Yeah, great question. So um, when I do my composites, I, I typically will see if I have any images. I do have folders where I um, keep mainly textures. I do have some other objects that I shoot. So I've got a collection of like door locks and um, mainly textures that I see out and about that I could use. Um, so for some of the images that you saw earlier where, um, maybe I added a stack of wood or I have an image that, um, I don't think it's handy to pull up, but it has a, I uh, made it into this red riding hood scene. It's got this red riding hood lady. It's not my typical work at all, but I was doing an artistic composite. Um, I was in a group. And so I had to go to unsplash. So the, the website is UN splash. And you can get free images there that you can use. Now, I always say while they are out there for free, if you were going to sell the work or do something with it, you would want to give the other artist recognition. You don't have to because they put them out there. You can also purchase images on there. But if I'm just going to get like a stack of wood or um, maybe as, you know, an animal or, you know, something like that, I sometimes will go there if I don't have it. Um, so Unsplash is a good, a good place and you can get it free or you can purchase, or you can go to Adobe stock as well. If you're an Adobe user. Um, so yeah, great question, but I do keep a folder of things because I, I do like to play around with composites. I, um, don't do them a lot, but every now and then I'm either in the mood or I think the image really suits it. Thank you, Laurie. Last chance for questions in this break. 
I think we're all set. Okay. So I thought I'd show you, um, this was, um, uh, let's see. Yeah, I guess this was the original image. Um, this was shot with a lens baby. So you can see there's circular blur and then there's just a center part. And this is out um, at Bull Run on the battlefield. And so I did a couple versions of this image. This is kind of making it a, a winter scene, of course, changing the sky, which was easy to do because it's such a, was a cloudless sky day. I'm adding some light and enhancing it. And then this was more of a just um, darker view, different type of sky, and then adding some light and some um, smoke coming out. And I could have continued to kind of add to it if I wanted. I also cleaned up, there were some people in there and some things like that. Um, so over in Photoshop, you know, this would be one where I would use Photoshop and would room, um, add a sky and, you know, add some light and do some things like that to it. Laurie, um, real quick, uh, Christine reminded me, um, while, you know, while everything goes and like, I like what you said that even though you've got free stuff out there, you, you definitely want to credit the, you know, you want to credit the creator. Uh, Christine reminded me to just remind camera club members that, that we do not allow uh, any composites in there that you have not shot, but now for your personal art and everything and, and, and professional art, that's great. That's just a, that's just a rule we have. So Christine was right and kind of reminded me that, Hey, you might want to, you might want to toss that in there real quick. That's just for our competitions only. Yeah, most competitions are that way. And so that's the other thing when you can create a composite, think about are you going to include it in a competition because they will ask you to certify that typically. Um, so I often get asked how I add light to images because if you um, if you looked at any of a lot, most of my composites, I take historic buildings and I love to bring them to life. Um, whether it's an old broken down building or barn or it's a historic building. And so um, since I had this one um, handy, I pulled it up tonight. Um, so in there are several things that I would do in this um, with this image. There's one tool that can help you as you're starting to create a painting look image, and that is to do a color lookup which is this very similar to doing maybe a filter in another program. Um, it's also very similar to doing a preset in Lightroom. So you've got several places where you could do this method. But if we come and go ahead and do color lookup, you've got all these different options. So we could make the image look like a foggy night, fall colors, um, crisp winter, um, all different options that are going to give you kind of different color themes. And so I really like this warm look. I'm kind of in the mood for that today. Um, and I can always bring that opacity down and kind of change it a little bit if I want to and modify it. So color lookups are a great way to, to add different tones and bring out different qualities um, in your image. And it can help you on the way to creating that kind of painterly look. Um, so another way is, of course, if you want to add some light. And so I'll just um, show you real quick. There's several ways that I do this. One is I can make a selection and um, come in and there's the new object, the object selection tool that's been um, updated. And so sometimes I'll try that and make the selection. And then um, I can grab grab my brush, but I need to I need to pick a color. And so I usually start with something usually in the warm tone. So maybe adding a little bit orange yellow. Um, and I will add multiple colors over to get the look that I want. Now I would want to make this image um, look darker um, to add the light, but I'm just going to show you for for now. Now I need to get a soft brush because I was playing with brushes earlier. So let me go get my soft round brush and make it a little bit smaller. And I would just come in and um, brush. Of course, that is super bright. So you want to always check your opacity. And I'd probably start maybe around, around 20%. And I would just start applying it and you know, layer it as thick as I want. Sometimes I make it a little brighter at the top where the light might be and then kind of come down with it. And then I could also change this blend mode if I wanted to reduce it or make it a soft light. 
and then Command D or, you know, to clear my selection. Selections can work. You can also hand do it if you just kind of want to come in and add just a little bit of light. And you always have to think. So if you're doing a real painting, a painter would think about where the light is falling. And so if this was truly a dark scene, I would come in and pop some light coming off the ground from this house light. Or if there's a moon, you'd want moonlight coming down. So you always want to think about those features when you're um, adding light. Um, if you add light on a porch, adding some of that, just popping some of the light on it can um, really make it look more realistic. So those are some ways that you can, you know, add light. Now, once you're finished with kind of your basic edits, there's a couple things that are really easy to do, even if you're not a pro at Photoshop, to make your image look more like a painting. Um, one would be adding texture. Um, you can also use some of the filters that are available in Photoshop. And so let's look at a couple other images. Um, so this is an intentional camera movement image of these flowers. And it looks pretty artistic to begin with. It was shot with um, intentional camera movement. But I'm going to duplicate the layer. And there's a couple things I could do here in the filter. So the, the easiest thing is stylized oil paint. And I think a lot of people use that. Um, you have so many options with this oil paint feature. I like to keep all the options over here on the far right and keep my lighting over to the far left. I think this gives the most natural look, but if you wanted something that's much heavier, you could bring your stylized option over and even your cleanliness, and it's going to give you a heavier painted look. So it really is, um, is optional. I'm going to go ahead and I'll bring it over to the middle so that you can see the difference. Um, we can also bring this over. So I'm going to make it a little bit heavy. So if you haven't used oil paint, now you can see it's giving that true painting look. So you can decide how much you want to use of this or how little um, as you're working with it. But oil paint is um, a great option. So another option would be under filter, there are some additional options that are artistic, but they're only available if your image is in 8-bit mode. So you want to go to mode image and change it to 8 bits versus 16. Now that is not changing your true pixel size. So it's just a Photoshop feature that you have to do if you want to use some of these artistic filters. So now we can go to artistic and we have all of these options. You can see there's watercolor, fresco, um, palette knife. I mean, it's, it's endless. There's texture. So texture is one that I like, and this is going to give you that kind of finished look that makes your image look like a painting. So this is my favorite. It's applying the texturizer, and you can just see now what a difference. This truly looks more like it's been printed or, you know, built up on canvas versus the oil paint. So the oil paint's an option, but this texturizer is really nice. You have several um, options available. So there's sandstone. There's canvas, which looks a little bit more like canvas. Um, and you can try the different scaling and, um, you know, click OK with that. And it's probably hard to see on the screen, but it's just applying very gentle texture to the image to give it more of that painting look. So let's look at another image, and I'll show you a couple other. This is another intentional camera movement. This one's kind of a, um, a blob, um, but I would do some of the same techniques with it. Um, you could also try some of the neuro filters. Um, let's go to, um, so this image is one where I thought I'd show you the pointillism technique, but let's first go ahead and look at these um, filters. So I'm gonna go to image mode, and again, I'm gonna change it to eight bits. And um, under filter, we've got, again, all these different, we can go to watercolor and, you'll see that it's going to give you all different options to make the image. Now, that's pretty heavy handed. So you, you, wanna, you wanna be thoughtful with it. Um, you can also bring down the brush detail, the intensity. Um, there are the palette knife can be a nice one. And once you select it, you can alter 
the blend mode when you bring it back into your layer panel. So if you use the rough paste pastels, um, there's the smudge stick. I mean, there's just tons and tons of options. Um, they even have plastic wrap. Here's a sponge. And once we um, bring that in, we'll click OK. And you can then decide, this is giving more of that pointillism look. Um, you also, of course, want to do this on a blank, on a layer, not the background layer. You can then change your opacity. So just some other options there with that, um, with that option. Now I'll also show you, let me go back to the open and I'm going to make a, a background copy. There's also under filter neuro filter. So this was a new feature. I think it's been almost two years ago. Um, and there's tons of options in here as well within Photoshop that will give you that painted look also. So there's some style transfers that you can play with, color transfers. Um, and so style transfer, if we turn that on, this is where you can actually take another image and you're transferring the style of it to your image. And it will give you a, a pretty impressionistic or artistic look um, to your image. Now it can also, you know, it's completely changing it when you do the um, style transfer, of course. So it's taking your image and just really messing with it, but you can reduce the opacity. Um, you can pick different image styles and you can see what it does. So this is kind of the far end of things. Um, there's also the color transfer, which is allowing you to give some color effects and changing some of your features there. Now, remember with these, you don't have to use them at 100%. So usually if you wanted to use some of the qualities, you could then blend it when you bring it back in. Um, so I'm gonna cancel because these take a while to process. Now, one of my um, favorite things to give something just a very soft painted look, but still keep the photograph, a little bit of the photographic qualities is just to add texture. So this was the image before it was shot wide open, really soft, the peony, but just adding the texture kind of smooths the background and brings in <clears throat> some additional artistic quality to it. This image, very similar, wanted this tulip to look a little more um, like an old Dutch painting. And the Dutch painters used very muted colors, um, a little bit more dramatic, and so um, again, coming in and just adding a texture to this image. So if, um, if anyone would like me to demonstrate how I add texture, I'd be glad to, but I also don't want to um, bore you with things that you already know. So um, we can do that if you want me to. This is another image where um, I didn't just add texture with this image, I actually painted. So within Photoshop, you have brushes and um, brushes are a really fun way to add some artistic qualities to your image. And so there's a set of brushes that's impressionistic. And under that, you've got all different kinds. I love this one that's a Saison. Let me get on a um, blank layer and I'll show you. And so I can come in and grab my color picker and select maybe this darker purple and now go back to my brush. And you can see at 100%, it's, you know, it's got, this is what it's doing. You know, I could brush it all over and then I could reduce the opacity. Um, I could change the opacity on my brush. And so that's typically what I'll do. So this is where I get to feel like an artist, even though I am not a painter, but I like to usually use the brush pretty large and I can just create my own texture. So instead of buying textures, you can come in and create your own, just softly adding some of that texture around your image to give it an artistic look. And then I could come in and maybe I go and I change this color and I make it a little bit lighter and I come in and I layer it some more to just build up the texture on the image. So I'm just kind of clicking around and I could even try different, um, there's a Monet one and it's gonna give different brush strokes. And you can see with that one, it's actually changing the colors as it goes. 
So I may decide that I really, you know, don't like that or I may like it. And then the beauty is I can always change my blend mode over here on my layer and just really soften that to create it where it's more, um, you know, like a painting. So brushes are a fantastic tool if you haven't or aren't familiar with using them. Um, it's a fun way to bring, bring some artistic qualities to your images. And there are all kinds of brushes. So not just for textures for flower images, but you could add leaves to a fall scene. Um, you could take a nature image and add leaves. You can um, do all kinds of stuff with them. Um, I have an image that if it's available, I'll pull it up really fast. Um, this is an abstract that um, I did using, um, this is um, multiple, it's one image of a bridge in Charleston and I flipped it um, and then added, um, used brushes to create these geometric. And this would be um, probably if I added some of that canvas texture could look more like an abstract um, piece of artwork. So no matter what style of photography you shoot or you like to work on, you can use um, those brush tools to add some, some fun elements to it. And then adding texture, adding blur, um, those kinds of things you can do with other applications. So if you already have the program Topaz Studio 2, it does all of those. Luminar, um, the new Luminar does some looks where it will add some things. Um, they are no longer selling Topaz Studio 2, so I didn't want to demonstrate that tonight since you can't buy it. Um, but again, there's all the apps that are good on a tablet or your phone where you can also apply textures and some of those qualities. So what editing questions can I answer? Or if there's something I you want me to demonstrate, I'd be glad to do it. Any questions here? Program I was thinking was just Topaz or uh, Topaz Studio. That's what I was trying to think of. Uh, that's what JC was thinking of earlier. Um, Lori, I'm going to pass it over to Christine because I think we have uh, a question or two in, in the Facebook chat. My quick question is, are you using a digital tablet? No, I do not. I have a large trackpad. I'm a Mac user. Um, I have tried a tablet and a pencil, but I really prefer my trackpad and um, I, um, I just use it. Okay. On Facebook, Scott asks, you say it, said at one point that you're making the work have a more artistic look. How do you measure more? Is it a more artistic look at simply a new look or a different look? You have changed what the photographer sees. Hmm. Um, repeat the question again, the first part. Uh, at one point, you said you're making the work have a more artistic look. How do you measure more? Um, so what I mean by that is just that to have it have a studio art look is doing more. You, you have to do more, more to the image if, if it's truly considered a painterly um image where you're trying to make it look like more like a painting. Um, you are doing more things to it. It's typically not just straight out of camera, I'm not saying it couldn't be, but typically you're taking your vision for the photo and you're taking it further. So, you know, this tulip photo would have been, it was, it had beautiful light behind it fine on its own. But if I want to give it that painterly, what's considered a more artistic look, I can add texture, I could add extra blur, or, you know, I could do anything to manipulate the image. Um, I think a lot of, a lot of artists that I know and that do this type of work enjoy the editing process as much as the shooting. And they also enjoy um, creating either composites or, um, the idea of digital painting um, versus studio painting. So there are photographers that love photography, but they also like to layer that with digital painting is how I would answer that. Okay, online, um, Debbie is asking, 
I know you can buy textures, but how do you make them? Are they all made with brushes? And this oh, is kind no. of important because for our club, any textures you use have to be your own for oh, that's, competitions. That's a great, great question. So. Yeah. So um, I'll go see if um, I can bring some in really quick. Um, so what you can do is you can shoot texture out um, in um, when you're out and about anywhere where you see um, textures. You can also shoot things um, with intentional camera movement. You can shoot things out of focus. Um, let me go to my series real quick and see if I can get to my texture file. And then what you can do is you can bring that texture that you shot in completely, um, overlay it, or you can apply a blur and, you know, that kind of thing to it. So, um, here's an example. Oh, here's a perfect example. So I did this for one of my classes. So I shot this brick just random. I mean, it's a true snapshot. I mean, it's just this brick I saw, I think again, this was in South Carolina. And then I took it into Photoshop and I applied a box blur. And I know that because it has some lines in it um, to make it a texture that I could use then on another image because I liked the color and the light. This is another example. This again was some brick stone. I just liked the color. And then I did a pretty heavy blur. Um, so if I take, take this into Photoshop, um, and you could do it on another app. So you could basically blur your photo um, or apply an artistic element like an oil paint or something like that um, to the image. So I'll duplicate, um, come up to filter and under blur gallery. One of my favorites is box blur because it gives you a lot of these lines and texture and you could decide how much you wanted to blur it. Click OK. And then I could go up and apply the oil paint or I could change the mode again to the 8-bit and I could apply that canvas texture to it. And then I could use that um, over an image. And so that's a great way to create your own um, is just shooting things and bringing them in yourself. So I just have a collection of textures and will... Um, use it from time to time for different things. You can also, of course, use brushes if you're allowed. Um, so I would click OK. And then what the beauty of this is, is you can duplicate your background layer multiple times and do multiple different techniques to this and save them out. So you could take one image and have countless textures that you could use um, to overlay. So let's see. I'll just take it and see how it looks over um, our little bull run scene. Um, yes. And I'm just gonna pop it over and then change the blend mode. So it's kind of kind of interesting. I don't know that this is the one that I would use, but you know, Regardless, that that definitely is a way to make your own textures and you can just have your own collection of them. Um, you could take an image. And so if we go back to this image, you could also, um, and I don't know, Christine, if this would be allowed, if you took the image, can you then apply brushes to it? Yes. As okay. long as it's your own photo and your own textures, you can mix any, you can make composites of your own art. Okay. So this is where if you come into the brushes, oh my gosh, there's splatter, there's all kinds of different options. There's also, um, you can get texture ones and you could come in and pick a brush and manipulate um, your image with the brushes to make your own texture. Um, so that would be something that I would definitely play around with. Um, there are some really neat let me see where this one is um uh, let me go down to winter 2023 there's a really neat texture i played with the other day um yeah i 
think it was this confetti one, makes these marks all over it. I mean, you can do all kinds of things with brushes, so you would just have to kind of play with it. Um, and of course, I've got a purple color on right now. I wouldn't want to do that, but maybe I want to add some more of this rust um, so I could select the color, you know, and come in and make my own texture um, with some of these blocks and things like that, depending on what you're trying to do. So yeah, you've got, you've got tons of options with your own image and literally you could take any image and come in and apply blurs and um, blur it out and then do something with it. So yeah, this one's kind of liking this one. So, um, you know, and change the opacity and kind of play with it. So yeah, these brushes are, are really, really fun. And you get so many already included in Photoshop. And then you can go to Adobe and search in Adobe Creative Cloud um, brushes. And there's tons that you can download for free. It's one of the free things in Photoshop. I can't believe they don't make us pay for them. But um, yeah, and then you can try different blend modes. So you know, you can come in and do all kinds of weird things to make your own texture and use it um, in an image. What other questions? You can also get free. So I will tell you, it's a site called um, Coffee Cafe and she has a blog and she does give free um, textures pretty frequently. So it's a great site to go to. And she has some really nice textures that um, she does. If you like to paint, you can paint your own textures and then take a picture of them. If you like to make your own backdrops, you can also take pictures of those and then use them. Yeah, I was just so several say, ways. Yeah, I was just going to say you can, if you really want to get into some work, I just go to Home Depot, get me a two by two, a two by four board. It takes me some drywall compound, mix it around and take different color paints and splash it on there and make very, make very, very good textures if you want to do more work. <laughs> yeah, they're fun because you can then use them for backdrops if you want to. Um, yeah, or get something, scrap around the house and yeah, make your own. Any other questions about some of the tools available? Fred is asking if you use Luminar Neo. So I used to use Luminar oh. and I was actually an ambassador and um, I did not switch over and I do not use Luminar anymore. Um, I did not, um, when they started getting more and more into their AI stuff, I felt like it was over processed and I just um, didn't find I was using it enough to make the switch. So I, I went with Topaz Studio 2 and um, I use Photoshop and Lightroom and I use several different apps. But um, no, I just think, I think Luminar is a good program and it's really good for someone who doesn't want to spend the money on um, Adobe, but you have to be careful that you don't over process the images. Oh, one more from Bob. Bob? Uh, Bob's a man after my own heart. Uh, he's asking if you ever used a pinhole lens on your on your digital camera. Um, I haven't used, um, I haven't like made a pinhole lens or have a pinhole lens to use, but I have, I do shoot through quite often. And so um, I, um, see if I can get, oh my goodness, this is going crazy. There we go. It stopped sharing, I think. Okay. Um, I do um, do shoot through where I will cover lace around my lens or um, other things that I shoot through, like a copper tube or something like that. So. Okay. Any other questions? Any questions online, Christine? I don't see any. Okay, Laurie. Great. Well, thank you guys so much for having me tonight. I appreciate it. And um, 
I hope you have fun creating your images for the competition. Well, Laurie, since this is the end, I've got one quick question for you. And, and JC touched on it. What are you doing? Are you are you printing anything out and then and then maybe distressing it or maybe, you know, it, the old thing, the old big thing with wedding photos used to be taking that acrylic gesso and, and kind of painting over a photo to give it the texture or, um, you know, any kind of any kind of organic adjustments to your images and then maybe scanning them back. Are you are you are you doing only digital or are you doing some some like organic as well? Um, I have done that a long time ago, but, um, now I'm, I'm pretty much, um, doing it digitally. And then I do print on different types of paper. So I've had some things in some galleries where, um, I like to use Bay photo and they have artistic paper and you can decide what texture you want that paper. And, um, I have used that. I have not gone in and like applied glazing or other things to my photo. Um, but I know some people that do, and it, it can turn out really, really neat and interesting. So I do like the creative papers. Um, if you're going to really invest in something and you want it to look a certain way, those are absolutely beautiful. Excellent. Well, Lori, thank you so much. We do have a competition coming up. It is, uh, it's not, it's not this month. It's not next. It's the next month. What's that? April. April is our, our print and digital competition on looks like a painting. And Laura, you, you, sadly, you gave a lot of people some great ammunition. So it's going to be a really tough contest for sure. Well, well, good. I hope so. <laughs> and, um, I hope you guys will stay in touch. And again, um, I, on my website, you can subscribe. I do a monthly newsletter. If you're interested in my type of work and my YouTube channel, I would, um, love more subscribers, of course. And, um, if you're, if you enjoy the videos, so. Thanks so much for having me. Perfect, Lori. Thank you uh, so much. I've, I shared your website a couple times in the chat. If you can make sure Christine has your uh, all your social media stuff, we'll make sure that gets out as well. And uh, again, um, look for an email next week on a uh, on a show that we'll have at Woods Church. And then uh, next week is the 23rd. And it is our print competition on glass. Make sure to get those uh, get those photos uh, set up. And with that, I'm going to say good night. Laurie, hang out a little bit, and uh, let me close out, and we'll, we'll get right back to you. Okay. Okay. Good night, everybody.